start so very good evening to uh, everyone uh, this is the out of uh, context book club which is based, based in goa and uh, today we are having uh, an event which is called as uh, meet the author usually we uh, what we do is we uh, choose a book and we discuss the book at length and sometimes we do a me, uh, meet the author so uh, it's it was very exciting when uh, this uh, happened with uh, shanis uh, uh we came across each other uh, so to say and um, uh, we decided to have this meet the author and uh, it was really nice and uh, there are our book club members as well we have recently about the book club let me do this uh, we do do the customary things first about the book club we have just finished uh, uh, 100 book readings some time back and then after the 100 after the monkey was off our back uh, there was kind of a lull so then um, uh, then we came across uh, shanis's uh, book of stories and there are about 28 stories in the book it's a collection of 28 stories and uh, that I, i think i myself personally read almost the entire book in one sitting in one day so it more than made up for the lull that uh, we had for the last uh, couple of months so uh, nice to have shanis and uh, everyone book club our the out of context members welcome nice to see all all dina tanaya uh, eric put your uh, video on aaron is there and uh, uh, frederick maybe hima also is there uh, uh, let's have a discussion let's have a great discussion so as usual let's uh, let's introduce the author first she's from our own neighborhood and uh, what we do usually is we indians we uh, or at least the book club we uh, we uh, try uh, we read stories or we read books from all over the world but then we try we uh, often ignore our own i mean our own authors and our own neighborhood so uh, reading sri uh, something from sri lanka was uh, really a great experience and then we'll come come to that later on so i'll introduce uh, shanis she is um, an author from sri lanka not based in sri lanka as such as now she is based in paris as of now and uh, she was working in the airline industry industry uh, and now she is an interpreter yes right and uh, she is a linguist knows many languages i mean french and spanish and english and sinhalese of course uh, uh, she she won the first i mean she uh, the the first the, the titular uh, story in the uh, collection the aya yeah that was written when she was uh, very young i believe maybe 17 17 18 was it I, exactly I, I, yes 18 yes 17 18. or 18 yeah it's very young and that won the british uh, british council short story competition and from there this collection has come and has uh, come to fruition as a collection of uh, stories in a book uh, in a book form and uh, today we are indeed very happy to uh, discuss uh, stories from the book and uh, yesterday when we uh, uh, chatted up um, i told shanis that is not going to be a usual uh, interview session and we are not going to burden you with questions and uh, you, you can sit back and uh, relax and the book club is going to discuss your stories but a small uh, uh, word of caution uh, why you are the lizard uh, chirping oh no 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 <laughs> i don't know the lizard ch chirping at all so don't worry uh we are going to uh, uh discuss each story and we may not be able to spend as much time um uh, on each story because there are 28 to be discussed and uh, we'll just spend a little time on each uh, we'll just um, i have the index page in front of me we'll uh, go through each one and uh, discuss what each, what each one liked about each story and then maybe we can uh, take uh, shanis's uh, feedback about how it came about and uh, stuff like that okay is that okay yes. that sounds fine happy to be with you and also very happy that it's not a question and answer session so i'm going to just sit back and listen to you and contribute okay. to you okay so uh, let's go to the first story that was there uh, the aya so uh, usually what we do is when we uh, discuss the story someone is a main sutradhar as such or the presenter of the uh, story or book so that person gives a short summary of the story or book and then we discuss it these a single story like this we discuss it usually for 2 hours on our regular sessions 
so today we have about one and a half two hours maybe to discuss 28 stories in total so it's um, i think uh, quite an uphill task but we'll try to do justice to uh, each one okay so uh, i'll start with the summary of uh, aya first and then we can uh, take one by one it's it's uh, as uh, shenis uh, mentioned it was written when she was very young at the age of 18 so I just knew uh, I'll uh, switch off the video for some time so, so as to save bandwidth. This was, uh, it's about, uh, uh, everyone knows who an Aya is. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's someone between a maid, maid, uh, maid uh, the, a domestic help and a babysitter, but much more, who is much more loyal uh, to the household and the children and someone who really uh, grows up with the children the children grow up with her. So there's an Aya in a household in um, uh, somewhere in Sri Lanka. This is set in Sri Lanka. And uh, the young girl is it's set with two women having a dialogue. So one of them is getting, the younger one is getting married. So the Aya, uh, and she's getting married to a foreigner. So the Aya warns her against uh, uh, getting married to a foreigner. And she she is insistent as to, uh, why do you want to choose a foreign boy? He may not, uh, today he may like you, tomorrow he may not like you at all. So then what are you going to do? Look at your mothers and sisters and uh, your, her sisters. I mean, they settle down with local boys. So Sinhalese girls should have Sinhalese boys. That's what the Aya thinks. But a girl, the young girl who, is, who has already given her heart to a, uh, to a foreigner, she is adamant. I mean, she is, she is also very stubborn and she says, um, uh, no, there's no harm and then I'm going to go abroad and think of the lovely things that I'm going to send you and all that. So, but the Aya has a sense of, uh, there's a sense of foreboding in the whole atmosphere. So, uh, uh, and that's how it, uh, it goes on. After a few days, the wedding day uh, dawns and the girl is getting ready for her wedding. And uh, there's a festive atmosphere in the entire household, except the parents who are really uh, dejected that their, uh, their daughter is going to leave them. Obviously, when a daughter is getting married somewhere that too out of the country, any any parent would feel quite um, lonely and um, uh, dejected. So, uh, so it's going on, and the wedding preparations go on, and the girl is getting uh, dressed up. All her hairdressers and makeup people are with her. Then suddenly there is a rumor that something something uh, bad or very wrong has happened, and uh, the rumor doesn't reach the girl immediately. I mean, the young girl. And uh, it comes only after a while. So then finally the mother uh, gathers up the courage to tell the young girl, because these two were very close, the Aya and the daughter of the house, baby of the house, they were very close. So uh, the mother finally uh, goes to her and says that there's some bad news and um, that the Aya has uh, just died. And then uh, the girl, she just, uh, she, uh, the last sentence ends like this. Then quietly she said, will someone hand me the jasmines, please? So it ends like that. I mean, it's it's quite, uh, for me, it was quite a stark kind of ending. And uh, it's it's open to interpretation. And uh, now we will uh, now we'll discuss and let everybody say what they think about the book now. About the story, about the first one. Sanai, can you start? Okay, so I would just like to say that, uh, you know, everyone has a very different relationship with their maid servants or with, you know, the care people who bring them up. And definitely this seemed to be exceptionally and close. Uh, it was a little, uh, I would say a stark ending, as Archana said, that, you know, there wasn't any emotion. Maybe she just suppressed it because she wanted to enjoy the moment. A wedding day is very special. And uh, I'm very curious to know that, you know, at such a young age, you've written this. It's a very kind of mature and a very well-written one. Did you have any kind of personal experience or something like that? Or you perceived something that made you write the story? Yes, sir. actually, I did at that particular age. And it has nothing to do with the person I eventually married, who's also foreign. But... Um... When the British Council came up with this idea of the competition, I just wanted to have a local atmosphere 
And so I built on the local atmosphere because I knew that that was probably going to give me points. And um, from there on, well, I had this idea of the lizard. Some ideas came from lived experience by sitting in the kitchen a lot with the ayah, discussing things, nothing personal, but just discussing everyday matters. And uh, that's how the story came about, actually. Okay. Wonderful, because you know you can sense the depth of the relationship because the ayah is so much at liberty to speak her mind. Otherwise, you know, some of them have their reservations or they don't speak so freely. But yeah, it was a very poignant story and I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Anyone else wants to say anything, comment on this, the first one? Ina, you want to comment? Tanya? Tanya, you're on mute. No, audible now. Yeah, you're audible now. Yeah, so I was uh, a little surprised at the ending, basically because um, I thought it was a little insensitive. But then later on giving it a second thought, I thought maybe the hex or whatever it was, the misfortune uh, had, you know, uh, the ayah, it was transferred to the ayah and the protagonist was a little relieved because of that. So uh, I took it that way and then she went on to enjoy the wedding. So I thought it was like a transference of, uh, of a hex or a, a of an event which was, you know, supposed to bring bad luck, and it it got transferred to the Aya instead of of the protagonist, and that's what uh, kind of gave her a sense of relief. So I would like the author to uh, to say if there's any truth in that. Um, that's a good interpretation, but it wasn't really the case. At this particular time, my sister was getting married, so there was a wedding in the air. I did go to the street to find jasmines for her the day before. There was also a friend's servant who passed away and she actually fell in the bathroom. So actually I took events that happened to different people and then pasted them into the main thread of the story. As for the emotions, it's actually part of my own life not to express, you know, part of my personality, not to express emotions and uh, often to keep them in me first because of what we learn in India and uh, also because I'm a bit of a secret person and I've, with time and with working in the airline business, I've got much more open and more friendly and more outgoing. But I was initially a very, very, very reserved sort of person especially I spent my school days, you know, buried in my books, not school books, all the rest. <laughs> yes. uh, anyone, anyone from the, uh, the others? Bina, you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, uh, one minute. Yeah, yeah, so Shanice, I really enjoyed uh, Aya and it kind of got the whole Sri Lankan flavor out to me. Uh, I really enjoy reading Sri Lankan authors um, because, you know, it, the way they write and the landscape they describe, even the customs feel very much like Goan traditions. And it's kind of a similar culture that we have. And it's the same coastal kind of uh, ambience that you create, you know, the whole uh, and the Catholic milieu and the wedding and all of that. It's something that most of us can relate to. And uh, as far as the, you know, the stifling of the emotion when the ayah dies, that's also kind of um, something that I can relate to. And that's also, I guess, a very uh, human-like thing to do when you have a big event that is about to happen. You kind of suppress something so you can get on with your life. So I thought that was a, you know, a very practical way of uh, dealing with the whole thing rather than, you know, kind of you're just about to get married and you're going to be bogged down with someone else's death, but you're just moving forward. So I can understand that. 
uh, I really like the dynamic uh, between the Aya and uh, I do believe that there was a time when the Ayas were more mothers than an actual mother. So they literally brought the kid up, uh, you know, in even nursing them. So there is more of a, there is a stronger bond between the child and its Aya than its own mother. So the Aya is usually a truth speaker and that does happen even in Indian families where she will tell you what your parents uh, or your siblings will not tell you. And because it's usually from a different class, they don't worry. They are not afraid. You know, so they will express their emotions. They may say it, say it very crudely. And uh, that was nice. You got that whole feeling out really nicely. I did miss a little bit of Sri Lankan touch in the dialogues, maybe a little bit of language, some kind of, you know, sure. words probably would have, because uh, I, I, um, I haven't, like apart from just movies and all, I haven't really heard a person speak Sinhala. It's a very beautiful language. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Can you say, uh, say something to us? In yes, sure. I was just going to offer. Maybe if I say something like uh, Mage Namashanis, you're going to guess what I said. Yes. We did, we did. It did sound a bit like Canada. No, it sounds like Konkani actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I feel very close to Goa, actually. I don't know if most of you are from Goa, but I really do feel very close. I think it's also the Portuguese Dutch. Yes. The Portuguese before the British. And as for the Dutch, they were sandwiched between uh, the British and the Portuguese. But definitely everyone has left their marks. And of course, the British most of all. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the way we write also depends on our different stages in life. At that age, at 17, 18, I was very much a rebel. Today, I've become much more civilized and more open to criticism and everything. So that shows also in the writing. And as for the Sinhalese, I agree with you. But the thing is, when you're 17 or 18, you're much more attracted by the West, mm -hmm. especially if you know that you're going to, you have the opportunity to go to university abroad. And I had that opportunity because my father took up a foreign posting. So I think I was really concentrating on the West, unfortunately. Today, I need a mix of everything. Yeah. Would you change the story if you were to write it? I think it's perfect. Oh, I mean, yeah, if you were to write, revisit. If you were to write Aya now, how would it end or how, how would it run, run its course? I think it would still run it run the same course because I think I, I need to shock also. I, I It's something in me to to want to surprise or to shock people also, to give them the ending they were not expecting. It's a classic short story. It's what you, you know, the twist in the tail kind of thing. So yes. it's just perfect the way it is. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, don't be, uh, just because they are uh, praising your first story, don't be, uh, uh, don't, uh, don't be relaxed that they are going to do <laughs> Well, I can I can guess that there's a lot more coming. Let's let's take it as it comes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I what what I interpreted is is it's a good riddance to bad rubbish kind of a ending that the daughter had it, had in mind. So um, even though she was very fond of the Aya, I thought that's uh, okay. That's done. But now I can go and. Uh, get married to my uh, dream husband and uh, get on with my life. That's uh, the, that's a way that that was the feeling that came in. Just hand me over the jasmines. I mean that that's the feeling that came came in for me in that last sentence. Yeah, but it was very poignant. Yes. Yeah, I can understand that everyone interprets it differently, but it wasn't really the case because I think the emotional bond was very much there. But there are times there are transfers, and maybe there was a transfer now too her husband or whatever in the story but that emotional bond was very much there i like tanaya's interpretation also that the bad luck switched on to the this transfer to the ayah I that's like very that. interesting oh, actually yeah. if it was studied in class maybe somebody might come out with it actually i would like very much that they are studied in a class somewhere been trying to look so for. this is your class right now <laughs> yes Patrick, anyone, anyone else wants to say something on this? Maybe uh, we have given you a short intro on the story. So if you would like to offer something, please go ahead. Otherwise, we move on to the next one.
I do have a guest here from France. I don't know if she'd like to say something. Yeah, please go ahead. Marie Emmanuel. Hello. Oui, bonjour. Si tu si tu as envie de faire un commentaire, peut-être en anglais. Si. Yes, of course. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be amongst you today. Hello from France to everyone. Hello. I hope you're feeling okay. And uh, I'm happy to be with you and to uh, listen to your feelings about these stories that I really enjoyed reading. And um, uh, I would be so happy to have uh, Tennessee's book studied in class with some of my students. I'm currently uh, teaching in junior high and high schools in France. And uh, I'm trying my best to convince some of my colleagues to uh, run a project for next year with some students, but we're still talking about it. So I'd rather not be too uh, quick in saying that it's going to happen, but I'm working on it and I would be so happy to share it with some of my students. So be really uh, in, I should say, discussions and negotiations to see what can be done. Thank you, Marie-Emmanuel. Let's see how it goes. Thank you very much for inviting me and I am staying with you and listening as much as possible to learn because is going to be you like to say something about the first story? Excuse me? Would you like to say something about the first story that we just discussed? Yeah, yeah, the first story in the book? Uh, I may, yes. Uh, the first story of the book was really uh, surprising uh, to me. It was a strange story at the beginning because I'm not accustomed to uh, the culture of uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, I was uh, entering it uh, really quickly with this bonding between this older woman, I assume, and this young woman getting married soon. And um, we don't have the same way of seeing things from, uh, I should say, the Western culture. And um, I had to keep an open mind to be able to read the book all through. And this first story was a bit strange, especially uh, when the older woman, the Aya, was trying to convince uh, the young woman that marrying a foreigner was not really necessary, that she could find uh, a good husband uh, around uh, in, our, uh, in our country, I should say, from the same culture with the same uh, expectations in life. And I was wondering if it was um, the main issue here or if the older woman was just maybe a bit scared to lose this young woman that she she loves so much, if she was not trying to keep this young girl to herself, because after all, she's really like a mother figure to her. So I was wondering if she was just trying to convince this young woman to stay because she doesn't want to lose her, or to stay because she doesn't want this young woman to lose her roots with a foreigner. This was the, the main point in my mind when I was reading this story. If I was to try to answer that, I would say the older woman was really concerned by the future of the person she had always protected and who she would like to continue to protect. Yes. It is not so much to keep, it is not a selfish aspect of wanting to keep her for herself. It's more in terms of protection because the Aya was also usually a protective figure and it is true that one has almost got to be from the East to be able to understand this, uh, the way it functions, actually. It's, it's not easy otherwise to, to have a this completely foreign culture as such. Yes, and this is why I, I, should, be so. yeah, I should be listening a lot because uh, I think every one of you who has this uh, uh, shared culture will be able to teach me a lot about how to introduce the culture to the, to the children. Uh, if we're about to uh, study it in class, we need to bring some background for them to understand and not to judge, just to open their minds first because it's art and it's also a way to learn from a culture that they're not uh, accustomed to, that they don't know yet. And... Uh, I think 
I need this background. I need I need your analysis to be able to bring the flavor of the book to a class. Okay, I will try to help you as we go on. Uh, yeah. Obviously not today, but before you actually introduce the, the book to your class, I definitely Thank you very much. Uh, so let's, uh, I think, uh, let's move to the next story, otherwise we are not going to have uh, any time. Uh, Veena, can you uh, introduce any story of your choice? And I think each one of us, uh, uh, of the book club, we can uh, do the same. Uh, Archana, unfortunately, I couldn't find my copy and I read it a really long time ago, so it would be better if I... Anything that you remember? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, if you introduce the story, I will kind of remember and move forward. Okay. I'll just... Uh, you want me to introduce the story? Okay, then uh, I think... Uh, Tanaya, do you want to introduce the story? Yeah, sure. Um, the story I liked uh, best in this collection was uh, Amidst Orchids. I, I think uh, that touched upon uh, the emotions beautifully. And it was uh, between a woman uh, who was um, bereft of, you know, uh, of caring or love in her life and the way she was going about it. So, um, and, and and the relationship between her and the man uh, who once, I, I'm assuming, loved her uh, was was beautifully captured in that story because the man still cared, the woman was not well, and she uh, wanted to go to a doctor. I mean, uh, but uh, since the, the person she was living with at present did not really care enough, she kind of was resigned to the situation. And uh, I thought that that was very touching because that, that usually happens in a lot of situations wherein, you know, the person you live with and the person who's supposed to care doesn't care enough. And so uh, you get, you, you are totally resigned to your condition. And however much a stranger might uh, want to help, or in this case, a person who once loved her wanted to help, she just doesn't show any interest. So I think uh, that came out beautifully in the story and that was my favorite. Uh, yeah, Bina, you want to say something on this? Bina, Hima, anyone? Frederick, Eric, Shailesh also is there, I suppose. Hi. I'm, Hi. I, I'm out because I've got a very bad signal and there are lots of kids playing around. So I don't know if you can hear the sounds of the kids. We, but, we can hear you. We can uh, hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. I'm glad you can hear me. Uh, you know, I've not read a, a lot of the story because I just got the book yesterday and I had a lot of work to do. So, uh, But I read the Aya and I think I read two, two more from there. And uh, I I know you have moved on beyond the Aya, but I just wanted to ask um, the author, Janice, um, why why does the wizard come across as so much as a as a bad omen because a few days back we were also listening to hema and she too was talking about omens and this this thing i think is so so much this 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 thing with omens is so much subcontinental or does it even go beyond now that Chinese is in Europe, maybe she'll be able to answer it better because she's got a better worldview. Yes. Uh, regarding the omens, yes, in Sri Lanka, we're very much conscious of uh, such things, the cry of a lizard, the cry of an owl, etc. And it so happened that we had someone working for us in the kitchen who used to kind of imagine also that the lizard coming often to the kitchen was actually her husband reincarnated. So all this kind of worked in my mind. And obviously from here, well, first I have no lizards around me, but uh, maybe I won't look at it like that. But at that point, I thought it could be a nice beginning for a story, introducing the kind of superstition that was around me. 
because I must say that in the country that I come from, we mix superstition with religion and that both of them go hand in hand. I hope I've answered your question somewhat. Yes, yes, you have, you have. I only wanted to ask you, well, does, does that some, is there the same kind of worldview or is there the same kind of concept of this omen that you'll also have in the West because now you are straddling two continents, to, so to say. You are straddling Europe and you're strad straddling our Indian subcontinent. And we too in Goa have, we too have a very similar kind of, um, let's say, history or I, I don't know, mythology about all this kind of sounds and the birds and the animals and the kind of things that like the crows, we have a lot of things that the crow cries and someone says, no, shoo, shoo, get the crow away because it's a sign, it's a bed of. So I wanted to know from you whether, you know, you all have the same kind of uh, mythology or same kind of uh, this thing over there in the West. Are you still based in Paris now? I am. Uh, yes, so, I live here actually. Then maybe and, as you settle these two continents, you'll be able to tell us what the differences uh, are. No, I don't think people are that superstitious here. In my first years at university, I used to also do what the others did, not to cross a black cat or whatever, or not to walk under a ladder when people were doing work, things like that. But basically, it's not a... It doesn't have the same weight. The superstition doesn't have the same weight as back yes. in, in Asia. And of course, the number 13. I even remember for the A-levels, we didn't have a number 13 attributed because uh, because it could bring bad luck. Yes. Yes, it, 13, is more of, 13 is more frightening in the West than it's in the East, I think so. Yeah, personally, it's been very good for me, actually. Yeah, my mom's birthday is on the 13th of August, and that's the day I was off my job moved, at Sri Lankan Airlines. Mm -hmm. I, oh, <laughs> I also moved into my apartment on 13th of, uh, 13th of March 2020. It was Friday the 13th, and I told my wife, I said, this is the day. You know, everything will be, you know, transporters will be cheaper, everything will be cheaper. Let's do it. And we did it. <laughs> exactly. I think we should be beyond Fred superstition. Frederick, is your mic off? Not working? Something? We can ask Maybe you. I'm, I, I don't know. Can You can't hear me very well. No, not you, Eric. Frederick. Uh, which Frederick? Lorona? Rico? Okay. And you can, if, if you want to offer some, uh, say something, you can, you can go ahead. We are not moder. I mean, we are mildly moderating it. But uh, if you want to butt in, you can, uh, anyone. Yeah, so I would yeah, just I, like I, to I, 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 I let finished my say. Ima. So, let Ima say. Okay. Yeah, so Eric, one thing, Eric uh, there is a story of, uh, you know, moving into a new house on Friday the 13th. Uh, you know, the, I would like to maybe talk about that after we discuss this one. And for us, all our functions like our New Year and Lori, everything is on 13th. It's very funny. Like, you know, Jan 13th and April 13th are very auspicious days. So sometimes uh, the 13th is not necessarily like, you know, um, that number or yes. I mean, of course, Friday the 13th makes it uh, thing. So afterwards, no. Eric, I would like to ask you about your experience of moving into a home on Friday the 13th. We actually <laughs> have a short story here. Maybe you can correlate that. My number. Yeah. To come to your thing was one one two, and you told me, No, no, it should not have been one one two, it should have been one one one. One one one, yeah, that's my number, that's right. Triple one, yeah. okay. so these are all little things about omens which, which are so you know steeped in. Anyway, okay, I've yes, had my say now. I think I'll, I'll just say. We'll yeah. continue with the book. Yeah, well, let's continue. And about uh, about uh, omens, I think it changes from religion to religion as well. Eric said that uh, crows are a bad omen, uh, but I think for Hindus, uh, it's um, uh, they are a sign of the ancestors. Any puja, anything, you give the first plate of food to the offer it to the crows, okay. right? So it differs from uh, religion to religion or culture Quite to possible. culture, even in India. So uh, if everyone is done with okay, we uh, the, that story we just forgot about Tanaya's story, the. 
living with the queens right that yeah the uh, emmet dot uh, emmet stockets that was a story that tanya introduced that's right uh, anyone wants to say something on that Dina, you want to say something? Dina, Eric, anyone? Any of the book club members? Dima. Uh, I have a question, which is like overall um, of all the stories together. So maybe I can ask that later. Yeah, that you can do it at the end. Yeah. Okay. General questions we'll ask at the end. Otherwise, we are going to get wailed. So, uh, Amit Sockets, anyone? Tanaya's one was a very interesting story, so maybe yeah. carry it forward. Yeah, that's what I I I felt it was a throwback to another story in the same book till uh, till tomorrow, right? Till tomorrow, right? That's the one. In in the in both the stories, uh, uh, the prote I mean uh, the in Amit Stockets is a woman who grows goes blind, and in Till Tomorrow it's a man who is going uh, blind. So it felt like a throwback to. Uh, the story uh, as far as emmy stockets is concerned uh, i did feel that uh, he is just a next lover or uh, someone whom she loved long time ago and who has just come to visit her uh, knowing her condition and then she doesn't care whether uh, someone is there to support her or not and she is just she is uh, she is going to carry on through life and uh, the man is more affected by her blind going blind rather than she is i mean the woman seems to be quite strong enough to carry on with her life with her uh, condition but the man doesn't seem to be so so that was my interpretation of that story i think that's interesting because it's actually quite close to archana's interpretation what i also felt about the story or my angle in writing it but until tomorrow then there was the real pain mm -hmm. yes okay hima you want to introduce another story or summarize one you are on mute hima yeah sorry i thought it was very appropriate to have the one since eric brought up the topic of moving into a house on friday the 13th Uh, I was just not very sure how to pronounce the name of the family. Living with the Ayuns, right? Yes, Ayuns. Okay. So uh, you know when you start reading, the first line sets a tempo where you're expecting something odd to happen, either mm -hmm. odd or something inauspicious or challenging or difficult. You know because you speak of Friday the thirteenth, and it since it comes twice a year, it's you know like. uh one could easily avoid it but then sometimes it does happen that one does shift in so i enjoyed reading the story and uh, also about you know house hunting how difficult it is how challenging it is especially if you have a budget you have so many things to you know uh, like the distance to work and uh, whatever issues they had they somehow managed to find a house but i think the previous family was just living in their minds more than in the house that's what i found like it was more of an extension of the mind because uh, of course when people live their vibrations their aura everything does remain but normally when another family comes in you clean out the place you clear out the you know the vibrations so i just was very intrigued by the way that they were imagining them around so much so uh, i just would like to also ask you what was like the theme in your mind when you wrote this story uh, because there is a lot of different factors in it you know um, yeah and i found it very intriguing because they did have a hint of something could be going wrong but i felt it's more in the mind rather than in the surroundings um it's true in a way actually lots of things were happening and to be able to write it maybe i was exaggerating a little yeah lots of things were happening in the sense we came to this house this house where i'm seated right now 
on Friday the 13th. And my husband had um, a hemorrhage in his, in his eye uh, on the 9th of March. So just a little time afterwards. And some of my friends, especially Buddhist friends, would tell me, why don't you move out of the house? All your bad luck will go away. But it's, it's not that easy. When you buy a house and you've got a 15-year loan, you don't, you don't just walk away. Mm -hmm. You have to stay and stick it out. And that's what we did. The loan is over. We're still there. We are eating more now. We've got lots of staircases. So this is not, we're, going to, we're not going to stay here forever. But we went through that bad patch staying here. And it is true, I did get rid of that pot of hortensias, that hydrangeas, we call it in English. That, that, was, that was a true thing? That was a real thing? The hortensia, the hydrangeas? Yes. Yeah. The hydrangeas, that was true. But the bath overflowing, well, that was an accident. As for the bathroom door, which opened by itself, maybe it's a draft. Mm -hmm. And I added something to it. And as we moved in, there was an argument between one of my daughters and uh, my brother-in-law who came to help. So lots of things. And then also the person who sold us the house, he just disappeared. He disappeared into nature. I've changed his name. It was not this name at the beginning. I changed his name so I would never have any problems putting his name down in the paper. It was also Vietnamese, but it was a very common, I would say the most common Vietnamese name existing. So that's it. And as for hair, you might notice I've mentioned hair in that, in page 39. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, that's something I've always heard in Asia. And even today, I'm rather careful when I'm back in Asia about how I get rid of my hair and stuff like that. Now, I think things we're brought up with, things we've heard in our early childhood, they kind of stay with us right through life. Very true. They're I was going of... to just say that, yeah. Yes. Uh, for me, it was like a, it was a fun story, but uh, yeah, it was quite quirky and um, I think it had that it factor about, uh, about it. And uh, yeah, we we do Indians and Sri Lankans. I mean, people in the in the subcontinent do uh, share their uh, do share superstition. I mean, th that's a commonality I think in this region about uh, about omens and putting thing uh, people doing things for you and putting things in your house so that bad luck comes to you. That stuff I think is common in the subcontinent. Definitely. Even yeah. when the ro rose thorns were actually, you know, pulling my hair, mm -hmm. I just gave it a bigger effect, but it was just the rose thorns, so just exaggerating on something that was existing to be able to write. Yes. Anyone else want to say something on this? Tanaya, Bina, Eric, Shailesh? Bina, you want to say something? I'll ask later. You know, the problem is I read the book a while ago. I, sh I should have just reread it again before this. Should I choose a story for you? Then you can... Uh, yeah, do that. Uh, mystery in Mogadishu. Yeah, I, I particularly like this because it talks about a time when I'm assuming Shanice was a lot younger and the shenanigans that you and your siblings uh, kind of come up with over there and then the, um, the locals. So uh, it was a very interesting and also kind of uh, gives you an idea of the kind of uh, privileges you had as a child. Um, with your dad traveling all over the world and, um, you know, uh, getting a chance to see different cultures. And uh, I mean, that kind of came across um, in this story uh, with, uh, with the particular incident. I, I don't remember it right now, but uh, what I did kind of um, think when I read the story was uh, you have 
here you have these kids and this family from a Sri Lankan culture and then they get into Africa. And is that the story? That's the story, right? right? Yes, yeah. it is. So how, wh how was it like for you as a child? Can you, can you summarize it for everyone? Uh, I don't remember the full details of it. Not everything, just in, uh, just in a few sentences, maybe. What the plot, plot outline, maybe. It's about, uh, I think when uh, it's two kids and yeah. the, the parents have been uh, transferred there. And uh, the dad is also in some foreign service kind of a thing. And uh, the kids growing up there and there's some encounter with uh, locals, with uh, with one of the helpers at the house. And that's about all I remember. So uh, I wanted to know from Chanice how it was growing up in Mogadishu because we've always heard of Mogadishu being this uh, country which has always had uh, political strife and you know uh, a, quite a dangerous place to live in actually. Well, uh, yes. Actually, I only knew what it, it was like outside Sri Lanka at the age of 20. Because one would imagine that this whole foreign service business was meant during our childhood, but it wasn't. It was only when I was 20 and uh, when I came out to France to university, but I would join my parents for the summer vacation. Okay. And that was in Mogadishu where they were based. Nets on the windows to keep out the mosquitoes and then the whole atmosphere a nice maid from the country, the night watcher. He really had 14 vibes. I was really struck by that. The bush babies in the garden, all that was part of it. And of course, during that period, two, two years, three years, whatever, uh, lots of parties, cocktails, privileges of people on a foreign posting. And uh, the ladies meeting up for their sewing, sewing mornings, feeling quite important. Yeah, just all of that. If you like, I'll just, I won't read the book. I'll just read a few lines from that story. Yeah, please. To get the people into the atmosphere. Yes, please, yeah. So it's mystery in Mogadishu. And it starts with, I had just arrived in Mogadishu for the second time and was in a different frame of mind from the year before. Things went more harmoniously. Even my straw hat bought from Lakwana, the tourist shop in Colombo, had followed me intact from Paris to Mogadishu via Barcelona. My sister's guardian in the UK, Mrs. Gomez, had sent me a special present. Not only was she my sister's guardian, she was also my mentor. And then I'll get to the part where I say, just as my parents returned from their annual rest and recuperation leave in Nairobi, the first disappearance within the diplomatic circle took place. Because of the backdrop of the war and the possibility of kidnappings, the expatriates hardly stepped out of the strictly defined borders of the capital, Mogadishu. And then word got around that a special requiem service was to be held for the deceased Mr. Mark lost at sea, or so they said, supposedly gobbled up by sharks. I'll stop there, but I think I kind of set the atmosphere for the rest. Yeah, I think that would have jogged Bidan's memory now. Yes. And the way it ends, that is quite chilling. I think this was one of the most chilling stories uh... Or that's how I interpreted it. Uh, it is uh, so the 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 guy in the end, the the, the watchman, I think, watchman is it? The watchman who is there in the, this particular house with the two girls, he has seen it all, right? He has seen it all happen. So he's he's like uh, he's like a mole. He's like a planted mole somewhere, and uh, you better watch out. So that's what it. Uh, that's the message it sends out. 
actually the watchman in reality was very different he was very protective etc but i just had to have an end like this to build up the story twist, right sorry you had to have your twist i'm saying yes exactly exactly yeah. okay someone else would like to uh, uh, choose a story and then we summarize and then open it for questions anyone else eric you have any particular story favorite story Okay, uh, Aaron says the baby minder, but Aaron's mic is down, so I'll have to summarize it for him. Uh, baby minder, yes, page twenty-seven. So ba the baby minder is uh, just another one of the slices of life, and then uh, how this young working woman. Uh, this is this is I'm also I'm I'm summarizing it the way I imagine it. uh a young working woman a young working mother in fact she uh, she is going out to work and she uh, she she has no choice but li uh, leave her baby with uh, a babysitter and uh, of course being a young mother and that too from the subcontinent she will have this stares from all around that look what kind of mother are you you have left uh, you value your uh, your career more than your child and uh, you are leaving your child with uh, strange hands and uh, you're going out to work so it's just a day and then the uh, she goes about her work and she comes back and then this is uh, this is that the, the tw twist in the end that uh, shani puts uh, she knocks on the door and the door is not answered and uh, thankfully she has a spare key with her which she always carries and uh, she enters the house she she just fears the mother fears for the worst i mean for her child and when she enters uh, the baby is there thankfully but there is no baby mind or baby sitter so again it 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 that was also a chilling story for me and uh, just like uh, the other one the mystery in mogadishu this one also was a chilling story because who knows what what who was there maybe it was a um, uh, uh, i mean uh, serial killer who knows who was who was the baby mind or you never know what kind of person person you let into your house so that was my interpretation it it is true that this story is very much about fear i'll just see if there are first other comments first Yeah, anyone always having a babysitter or anyone to take care of your children is a very challenging task there's no right or wrong way of you know appointing the best person and uh, we have heard so many stories of you know uh, i remember even hearing this one story where a parent came in early and they found the baby missing and they found that they had given the the caretaker had given the baby as a loan to the beggars on the street for begging it was so yeah, that goes around a lot that kind of a story uh, goes around a lot in the metros and all yeah very unfortunate yes so uh, it was a very challenging task for being a working mother or working parents you know yes i think tanaya wants to say something yeah what i wanted to say about the story was there was a sense of foreboding and uh, when the baby was found safe and uh, uh, you know alive uh it was an immediate sense of relief from my side at least but then i thought that uh, you know she sees uh, she sees that the baby in minder is not in the kitchen or in the living room or the dining room but perhaps the, uh, the baby minder is in the washroom so you know i took it as just a paranoia of a parent and maybe the baby minder is there eventually and nothing not in, wrong. The, bedroom. Not in the bedroom with the husband no not in the bedroom with the husband no <laughs> no but then i i, I don't know about that but uh, since the baby was alone i assumed that the baby minder was alone with the child so you know uh, since it was mentioned that uh, she was not in the dining specifically that was not in the dining room nor the bedroom nor the kitchen so i thought maybe you know she the only place she didn't look was in the washroom and maybe it was just the paranoia of the parent and it was being projected onto the readers 
but uh, the author successfully did that of course because i was it was a relief to find the baby alive and well so i i would like to ask uh, stanis if that that was the interpretation yes i think it's very close to tananya's uh, interpretation and actually when you refer to the soft toys like her soft toys the little pink mouse and the gray hedgehog kept her company it's also in a way you're showing relief because you're coming you know you're just mentioning the soft toys there and uh, uh, the only correction was that it wasn't a working mother i was in my masters year and uh, i'd written somewhere something like the lecture was boring mrs bursia was absent and the lecturer who stood in there was not able to capture attention through 17th century england etc etc that's the only thing and uh, um and the half finished bottle also was a kind of a reference but basically it was on that fear aspect of a young mother you know whether you go to work whether you go for a lecture coming home and sometimes the lecture seems to take too long because actually you want to be back home you want a mixture of everything you want to work you want to be back home you want that comfort of knowing that everything's taking place well at home and uh, so once again i would really agree with your interpretation here tananya okay the lights have gone for me so uh, can someone choose another story because i cannot it's pitch dark for me here now tananya can you choose one more uh achana there's a power failure here as well for you as well yeah yeah oh what's with the lights today i can't imagine okay i'll just switch on my phone then but i can i can choose the story i can uh, summarize it and then you can take it forward yeah the story uh, i liked uh second best was journey to jaffna i thought that is very very evocative and it practically transported me to the place um mm. i i thought um and uh, especially when geeta right she she speaks about uh, her childhood and uh, reminisces about those bulto sweets i actually googled what bulto sweets were mm. <laughs> and uh, i i found out that they were stick, uh, sticky jaws basically and in sri lanka probably they were called bulto sweets okay um, i also you know the, the the way she has described the mangoes being eaten with the hot sambal uh, everything was the scents the familiarity you know the sights everything was very very evocative in that story and ultimately geeta search for her identity uh, i think this was said during the civil war and uh, her mother escapes with her uh, leaving the father behind the father is left behind but the the story ends on a hopeful note because after all these years she returns back to the place she belonged and uh, she sees the same uh, priest who was there she recognizes him and uh, uh i think there is a hopeful note uh, on which the story ends because she hopes to find her father somewhere still alive so it is a person's search for identity uh but besides that the sounds smells sights of jaffna were all alive in that story and it practically transported me there so you know that was the story i liked yeah anyone wants to say something on this the story i liked the story as well and uh yeah the way uh, the way a westernized uh, subcontinental girl is uh, projected by uh, the by by uh, by the author that that is you i mean uh, that's the kind of comments that uh, any any modern kind of a girl would get right oh thank god the light, lights have been restored now so um, that's the kind of interpretation that any uh, mm, any girl who is uh, who is kind of westernized that's the kind of uh, comments that she uh, gets 
and uh, the whole family i mean uh, the the when she travels to, uh, to japna and that was a that was nice that that was though it was uh, it was a very uh, uh, emotional thing for the uh, the protagonist in that author, in that story uh, it was like uh, it was like a travel kind of a travel tour kind of a thing for us while reading and how what is japna we always hear about the conflict in japna with uh, between the tamils and uh, the sinhalese people that's that is how we have uh, heard about it but uh, uh, but then the, it's it's it was a nice refreshing uh, change uh, to hear your point of view the other side i mean hearing the other side we always hear the the our side right so it's it's nice to hear from your from the from the other side and uh, also nice that there there are there are no political stances taken in this in this particular story where you could have gone political in this there was a lot of scope but you didn't do it so that was also a refreshing change i think and uh, in the end yeah she, there is some hope because at least she finds someone connected to her father though she doesn't find her uh, her own father she finds someone who is connected to her father so that's some hope that is uh, shown maybe her father really died in the in the conflict during the civil war yes i think that's open to interpretation but there were two or three points here the story starts with ul582 landed at colombo's katanaike airport and that's obviously sri lankan airlines the company i worked for and where i spent 24 years of my life so it has some symbolic meaning for me geeta was like a young girl that i met once in italy when i went to drop my daughter for training in italy and she kind of struck me she was sri lankan tamil and uh, i kind of imagined the story around her when she told me she had left as a child and it was also my way of uh, thinking about people who are tamil because in sri lanka it's there's there has been a kind of a division although it didn't exist when i was small we were taught that every community was the same we had friends from every community and we sheltered tamil friends in my house after their houses were burnt and it was very important for me to kind of get a message across that where i'm concerned there is friendship and uh, all the rest so this is something i lend to my tamil friends when i can yes and it is true that there is some hope although she probably never meets her husband uh, father again that there's this connection with father pedris yes and i'm glad you liked it because sometimes i had to touch on things and add description I used to sometimes get my nephews to read this, and and they would say, "But there's no description. There isn't enough of this. There isn't enough of that." So then I would sit down and write again, add things. The mango, I remember, I really worked on it. <laughs> It's disappointing when an author says all that, but it is true. You do but tend. But who, who was the person who puts his hand around her neck? That was that was quite frightening. I mean, for a single woman to travel like that to a place. Oh. uh which is uh, she's visiting after a long time right so yes. that was quite uh, scary but who was that person there uh just a person on the on the bus but this kind of thing does happen and very i mean actually when you take a bus by yourself on a long journey you can be sure that someone's going to try to get close to you It's, yeah that that's the what do you say uh, Yeah, that's a word. I mean, it's the risk of not right? being accompanied. Yeah, you have to be accompanied all the time, <laughs> in a symbolic or non-symbolic way. Okay. Anyone else? Bina, Hima, anyone? You are on mute. Vina, you are on mute. Vina, you are on mute. I just wanted to ask. Uh, you know, your most of your stories are true life incidents which have inspired you, or uh, 
because I know an author is a sponge. You just keep picking up, uh, you know, snippets from here and there. But uh, did you actually, ex uh, you know, experience most of what you've written about? Uh, because the stories are very different from each other. There is, uh, you know, a wonderful diversity of thought. Uh, there's a little bit of truth in everything, but the conclusion or the ending is often not true because uh, you start off with something real and then you tend to imagine or twist it or mm -hmm. in such a way that uh, it's not true anymore, but it was true at the beginning. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, I think... Uh, uh, We'll have the last 15 minutes or so, maybe 15 or 20 minutes to general questions, unless someone else wants to pick up a story. And then I think we'll go for the general questions after that. Eric, you want to choose a story or talk about any particular story? Uh, I was just wondering if anyone read The Moon Sisters? Is oh, yes, we did, yeah. And what did you all think of it? So, yeah, you, you oh, the Sorry. No, Tanya wants to say something on the Moon Sisters. I really like the Moon Sisters, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I like the story. Um, it was like a, a two sisters in completely different places. That was a little, uh, you know... Um, impossible. I thought a little impossible, but then... Uh, um, but then it could happen, so... You know, I took that with a pinch of salt. I took it like the, the how we have this thing in India, right? That kind of a thing. And the two sisters were fathered by a single father. That was how it was, right? It can happen, right? Yeah, and the other sister who, who's from uh, Israel, I think she knows oh, yeah. that Jewish. this is her sister. Yeah, the Jewish. She knows she, this is her sister. She knows this is her sister, so... Yeah. It could happen. True. It started off with when they were at the ticket counter and all that, and yeah. that which is really true, the rest is imagined just from a photograph. Really? And as for the story of a smile, that one I wrote when I was like uh, in my first year at university. Oh, and I love that one. I, actually, I want to read something from that, uh, that story. I mean, I want to read a passage because. Uh, and uh, the ending, that's what, uh, uh, that there's one word in the ending that um, I don't know whether it's a typo or what, but I'll start from, uh, I'll start from here, okay? If you don't mind, can I read a passage? Sure, go ahead. Okay, it was one of those days, a cold winter morning when a bowl of, uh, of soup would certainly have warmed us up. I stood in the queue of the cafeteria uh, resignedly to collect my quiche, Lorraine, comparing the prices I usually did, did on, my, um, on my student budget. The sullen-faced girl in charge approached me. She anticipated her I anticipated her usual rude reaction, her I don't care attitude. She, sh she handed me the quiche and for the first, for once, her freckled face broke into a smile. Immediately, I saw things in a different light. The pastries with a crack in the middle seemed to smile at me from their shelves. The eclairs with their chocolate coating gleamed. The apricot tarts beamed from their corner. I turned to go and on the exit surface, exit staircase, I smiled at someone who bumped into me clumsily. He smiled at the lift operator who grinned at the gray-haired teacher in her spectacles. Her serene features relaxed into uh, the resemblance of a smile when she met the pupil who had got 50, 5 upon 20 on her last paper. She was so hopeful, think, thinking she had done well this time, that she grinned at everybody and everyone in class and they all returned her smile. But when leaving, one of them smiled at the blind student whom we all helped and copied notes for. That stopped it all. Uh, whether stopped it all is the word or that topped it all is the word. I am not very sure. Uh, what? What the word is, whether that stopped it all, is it? Yeah, that, it, uh, according to me, it should have been that topped it all. Ah, okay. No, it was definitely that stopped it all. Okay. The communication, that stopped the communication, actually. Okay, that's the end of the communication, is it? Yes. 
Exactly. I thought I thought it was a beautiful story because uh, a lot of us we take smiles for granted, right? And uh, because we can see and and this person who cannot see doesn't even know that there are people smiling at her. So you know, I, I think uh, the ability to take a smile for granted is uh, is a privilege uh, which only a few enjoy, and we shouldn't take it for granted because. Uh, people who can't see don't even know that they're being smiled at, so they can't even appreciate those little things. That was my interpretation. Perhaps the tone of our voice changes when we smile. I'm just wondering yes. if somebody who is yes. blind would be sensitive to that. Mm. Yeah, that that yes. that is possible. It yes. does change. That is so true. Yeah. It is a wonderful observation because a smile is very infectious, like laughter. And I love the way you, you know, kind of moved it down. And then, I, I, like Archana, I was also confused with the la ending. I thought that, you know, it stopped it. But once you explained it, it made sense. It uh, did understand. But uh, it's a very interesting observation because when you smile or laugh, your the intonation changes. Your voice does change. Right. Yeah, your voice would, yeah, it becomes more softer. Exactly. I would imagine that, I'm sorry, I think I interrupted, that you too have, when you're reading the news, when you're listening to the news, you also have a blind, uh, sorry, the person who's reading for the deaf. Yeah. Yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. Some channels because, have, yeah. Yeah, I find it really interesting and uh, I don't always listen to the news, but when I do, I watch them. Because it's also interpreting, it's interpreting for the deaf and it's something I've tried to pick up. Once I went for a class in uh, interpreting for the deaf, I didn't like it because you got to use so much facial expression and that kind of embarrassed me. You know, use a lot of it because you exaggerate the gestures. But uh, that comes back to this thing which I said, you know, there's a tone of voice change and all that. So personally, I really like um, Amid's All Kids also. It was fun writing it, and uh, I hope you all liked it. There's it one which is very story. long. The whole collection. Which was your favorite story? Now, all of us have chosen uh, some, so which was your favorite story? I think it's Amid's All Kids. Yeah. At the beginning, it was the Aya, but like, like I mean, for most people, I've read it all over, I've seen it, I've spoken about it. It's kind of, I think I've out, I've kind of outgrown the eye. Yeah. It's done too much. For me, yes. it's the story of a smile. That's my favorite one. Right. And did you all manage to read Disappeared from Room 307? I enjoyed writing it. I yeah, was on training. Some of us read, who read the books, I think we read, uh, read all of them. Mm -hmm. disappeared from room 307 yeah that was quite a good twist in the end because finally uh, if you give it to your nephews they'll say okay nothing happens in the end right <laughs> nothing bad happens at least in the end yes i wrote it when i was on training what was wonderful about working for an airline was going on constant training and being sent abroad so at the beginning when i started american airlines we were sent to dallas and then i went to colombo on training. So that was really nice. I used to try to see that I got a kind of permit to go home to my parents and spend half the time there and the rest of the time at the hotel. But this was written while I was at the hotel when I imagined this whole thing. And the lady in the red car was really my mother. And uh, so I think writing is all about mixing reality with. That was, uh, one, that was one story I couldn't make any sense of actually. The lady in the red. Scarlet stop, is it? Uh, crimson shawl. Right. Uh, yeah. The lady in the crimson shawl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a story yes, I kind of more, It's so. more hinted at than anything else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, she's kind of anonymous and. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'd know how to explain it really. <laughs> Yes, and the last try. one, what do you think about the last one? Taneya, Hima, Ina, the last one? Nizam's, Niz, Nazim's, Nazim's prayer. Yeah. Nazim's prayer. Yeah. 
Are you asking me or somebody else? We're asking the book numbers. No, I, I thought that was uh, quite hard hitting because it was uh, during the 2015 attacks in Paris. And that yeah. was, yeah. So that was uh, a real tragedy. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's about the, the, you know, the quandary an immigrant is in of whether to return to his own country in this case uh, i think he's from tunisia right. uh, whether he wants to go back and live a life uh, you know uh, which is not as privileged as it is in in paris or stay there and because he's muslim basically exactly. so the lives of of a minority community there uh, how it affects him the whole and he's very empathetic towards what happens he basically just breaks down and cries, which goes on to show that you can't paint everyone with one brush. Right. So exactly. I think that that was what went to say. That's, that's really what I felt. And you know, this uh, the shoes. The main thing that struck out for me was the shoes, because uh, every every one of those award winning winning photographs and all that, they usually have a pair of shoes lying there among the entire carnage and all that. And that that tells uh, that that I mean that's uh, that tells such a big story about what must have happened, who it could have been. So it somehow brought back flashes of it. It brought uh, brought photographic flashes for me. Okay, I actually that story just started off by seeing a little notice on his window where he said, "Would this person come and pick up his shoes or something?" Yes, and. Uh, in the eastern part of Paris, where I was going for a morning class, I was trying to learn Tamil at that point. And uh, that's how I, yeah, the story came about. And the pigeons, of course, are very much part of the whole city here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I wanted to ask, ask you about uh, the interpretation for grandma's gelatin bowl. I didn't mm -hmm. get for it. Uh, what what exactly is your question? You didn't understand the sense. Yeah, of tell, your, tell us your interpretation, Tanya, first. Because I thought that uh, this person was totally unrelated. So the breaking of the gelatin bowl uh, was somehow, uh, I couldn't connect the two because the person did not even belong to her family. It was just a person uh, she knew from the village. And uh, I thought somehow you were trying to connect the two things, or maybe I, my interpretation was wrong. So I, that, that's yeah, what I, how I ended up with that man who fell in the river or something like that, right? I yeah. think I was trying to focus on my grandmother, actually, and how much she went out towards people. Actually, when I was reading it, I could get that uh, the sixth sense, the movie, that kind of a feeling I got throughout while reading that story because grandma is just standing next to her sort of thing. So yes. it was not scary, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, mm, I, I couldn't find the connection. I couldn't relate to the breaking of the bowl and uh, uh, how does it end? I forgot how it ends. I couldn't relate that breaking of the bowl. What significance did it have? I understand your question. Actually, uh, I just remember sort of beating the gelatine and having those reproaches and stuff. And then I think I was trying to connect all these ideas. And uh, of course, my grandmother in the middle who looked after people, who was very much into charity and stuff like that. And uh, did I mention Jonas before? Yeah, he's at the beginning of the story too. Mm -hmm. And I said, sometimes Jonas would take over from him in what, if one of his good days. And I ended up, but I, I would imagine that the central figure here is actually my, my grandmother all the time. And her, her impact on people or how she looked after people. But I quite agree with you that it's difficult to find a connection between uh, how the ball was beaten and how Jonas's uh, life uh, ended so it's yeah. probably not very well uh, uh, how do you say led or whatever yeah I could agree maybe that story needs 
so uh, we have grown up in the indian joint family and i find the children who are nurtured by grandparents are very stable and grounded in many ways of course this is just a general comment uh, mm -hmm. but yes i've had that and uh, my maternal grandmother lived away but i would always look forward to going and visiting her so i think you know on the children there is a very deep impact on the grandchildren so yes of the grandchildren I, I agree with you one has to go through the, those motions yes. and then transfer or transmit or whatever but it's not easy when you actually have to do it yeah i i wouldn't agree that those who are not in a joint family system because we started off with a joint family system and then then you separate right or the grandfather the parents pass away and then the families uh, go their separate ways i mean the individuals the uh, family stay uh, separately so i would not agree with neema that uh, stabilizes children in any way and uh, grandparents having them around yeah it's a great thing but then you know there are three generations now living together and it's sometimes really difficult uh, living with three generations you can imagine you cannot expect the same with the kind of uh, social uh, geographical political geopolitical uh, geopolitical uh, changes that are happening at such a rapid uh, pace nowadays you wouldn't expect that uh, uh, everyone would be in the same kind of influence maybe 100 years back what i thought would be the same uh, as what my grandfather also thought it is not the same now so to balance this it's it's a very it's a, it's a really a tough thing nowadays and uh, i am not saying whether it's a plus or a minus having your grandparents around you but uh, i wouldn't say that it destabilizes children in any way i think it's a question of personality no, yeah 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 in my not case yet. i still want to do things i might go back to university next year i might be doing simultaneous interpretation at university next year and for me thinking of looking after grandchildren is often a, a charge actually but it's not the same for everybody i think there are people who in their early 50s are very happy to settle down and look after grandchildren so i think maybe it's a case by case thing there's a question you know i'll read it out uh, a lot of your stories have uh, narrative threads that are carried out into other stories have you considered turning the shorter narratives into the longer form no i have not thought of uh, adapting or changing or anything actually my editor did not even correct some of the basic misprints so i don't think i'll be working on it again <laughs> do, I, do i did ask for it but yeah i agree with the aaron that there is a lot of deja vu kind of feeling when you read read one story from another and uh, you even a small thing even the gelatin bowl thing has come in another story i think and uh, besides the main story and it came somewhere else so it it's uh, we were just wondering whether there's something common going through all the stories uh life going okay. through the same passages of life over and over again okay i guess yeah okay any any, any questions more questions yeah i had a question for shanis um you've lived all over the world uh what place comes to mind when you say home what is home for you oh my god that's really difficult because when i go to sri lanka it's always home and in every sensation in everything i feel in everything i touch in everything i eat or my be or being barefooted i just love being barefooted on the grass etc but at the same time i don't know if i'll ever live there again and not because of possibilities but because of everything that's going on there mm -hmm. and uh, i never had a house there so that's already a, you know i'm not a millionaire just to go and buy a house somewhere so i think my my future is going to be here i've lived in two countries only actually only sri lanka and france but i used to join my parents in somalia and i've traveled all over thanks to my former job and uh, i think those 26 years were the most beautiful because they also taught me to be open to everybody and everything and uh, it's one of the most important things in my life actually
So I don't have to live somewhere to feel for someone from another culture, another thing. And the taste for languages also comes from that, to be able to communicate. I'm just interested in every, every part of the world and every language also. And I must thank you, Achana. It's been a Bummer. wonderful opportunity. And you remember yeah. I was fussing about when I was going to be free. And I was wondering if the police yeah. will call me to go interpret, but nothing like that happened. So oh, that thank was God nobody called you to interpret anything. You were just left interpreting your own stories for us. Yes, it was okay. nice and casual. Yes. OK, I think, uh, Tanya, do you have something? I think we have a few questions. We'll take them uh, as they come. Tanya, you want to ask something? Uh, no, Achana. I think uh, Shanice is already a little, uh, I mean, we've asked her a lot of questions and my questions are just pertaining to the story. So. OK. Uh, There's one in the chat here. Is there a sense of feminism specific to South Asia in your stories? I have, uh, yeah, that's a question. Maybe in a way, yes. I guess there's a kind of a female voice in in my stories, yes. Okay. Okay, yesterday we were having an uh, interesting uh, discussion on the group, so I think I, I thought might as well ask you, what do you think about piracy? Piracy? Yes. You mean? Uh, you mean book piracy. piracy. Book piracy, anything. Uh, it's very dangerous. <laughs> okay, then? You mean like photocopying things from someone's work and uh, yeah, things you like that? Yeah, like that, yeah. Because we had to circulate a few, uh, uh, I mean, we, we had the book copies and uh, maybe one or two stories we had to circulate because otherwise they would... you, you told me that. That's, yeah. that's not a problem because I have... I have got my rights back from my from my publisher, so okay. that's what matters. Thank At God. one point, I was not allowed to, but now it doesn't matter. Okay. As long as the book sells, though, because, and not that I get anything out of it, but at least like that, I do conclude and I finish with my publisher too. Okay, I'd like to ask you one now, two two questions. Um, we in the, I mean, we in India, I mean, we are so engrossed about uh, our own things that we look uh, with great interest to the uh, to our neighbors when we should be doing. But as a book club, we strive to read from um, all over the world, and we should also read from our neighbors, neighborhood. So, which Sri Lankan authors, contemporary authors, do you um, recommend? Uh, maybe you could try Shihan Karuna. Karuna Ratna or Karuna Tilaka. Okay. I will get you the right thing and send it to you later. Yeah, please uh, there's, I, yes, I there's Ramesh, Ramesh Gunasekara. Okay. And I should mention maybe Ashok Ferry. It's it's more humorous. He has a very humorous touch. Okay. Uh, well, those are probably the best known, but they're not the only ones. So maybe I should take more Even time and write to you. Any yeah. female, yeah, please do that. We'll, we'll be glad to have that. Any okay. female writers from the neighborhood? Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan even? Uh, no, right now I can't think of them. I do feed in this page called Asian Authors Abroad and uh, on Facebook. I'm not a Facebook fan, but I do that just for, you know, to keep it going. There's Punya Kanti Vijay Nayaka, who's a lady. Okay. And Bina is mentioning something here. Sharanya Manivaran. Is she, is she Sri Lankan? I, I'm not sure. Sharanya. Sri Lankan and uh, she also illustrates her stories. Okay. Just right. Yes. I'm going to try to get a list for you after the program, Achana. Yeah, please do that. Sir. That will be, yes. I mean, then we can have maybe another session even with you as one of mm -hmm. the participants who knows. Okay. Okay, lastly, uh, if anyone else has anything else, then I'll wind it with the last question. Do uh, interactions like this, the one that we have had today, I we enjoyed it a lot, I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, does it benefit the writer as well as the reader? And in uh, 
does the interaction uh, benefit and what is your takeaway from this well i noticed that you had worked through without having lights and uh, that's okay we are, we are technical okay. difficulties i i think and i actually enjoy having technical difficulties and you know having something like that which you've got to deal with on the spur of the moment and i think it was nice friendly casual and uh, got some interesting points of view uh, i think hemar myers is it I, i'm not too sure of the names i just see the names written here but yeah a lot of interesting questions uh, from her bina nayak a lot of contribution from tanaya and then nice to have a guest from france federic was was really silent but he'll make up for it another day <laughs> and uh, it it was good and if i was able to contribute in any case in any way i'd be very happy to do so or, or do it at a, at a later date if not okay uh, any more questions so if there there aren't any then uh, i like to thank uh, shanis and everyone for uh, coming to this session and uh, we had a wonderful time i hope there was uh, it was both ways i hope you enjoyed chenis interacting with, with your uh, readers as much as we uh, enjoyed it we do this once in a while meet the author usually it's our regular stories we dissect it left and right so uh, 28 was a bit too much to dissect but uh, as i said in the beginning we have more than made up for the slight slump that we have had and um, Uh, i hope you can join us for one of our regular sessions and uh, uh, be a normal participant in the uh, i will join sometimes yes in the reading and yes yes not the yeah. texting but reading not the texting no not the texting we are on discord now so we'll send you the link and then okay. you can uh, join us right so let's call it a day then everyone thank you a lot thanks a lot thank you archana and thank Bye. thanks all of you Thank Have you. a lovely yeah. evening. Thank Have you. a lovely evening. Bye. 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 Bye.